how we're going to do this. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. We are really glad you're here with us. We are at the Fly by the Seat of Your Pants Morro Bay Bird Festival, and we are presenting now uh, Tracking the Long Billed Curlew by Heather Hayes. And uh, we are really excited to have her in. And uh, we're going to uh, introduce her in just a second. Just a couple little housekeeping uh, notes. If you have questions, type them in there into the chat and we will try to get those questions to Heather, depending on how much time we have at the end. Also, these are free and they are also posted online at the Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival website. So if you would, if you miss something from the last time, you can get it again. Okay, you can check that out on the website and we'll see you then. Um, let's see, if you would li like to make donations, there are several ways to do that. And we'll post that slide at the very end on how you can do donations. It's either uh, by the mail or by a link or by um, the fancy little QR codes at the bottom of the page. Okay, so let me interview top right. Uh, hang on a second, Chris. I think we're okay. with our spotlighting. Okay, uh, are, ask if people are seeing you. Hey, can anybody see me? Uh, somebody yeah. maybe- Give us a um, wave. We had Jack there for a while. Give us a wave. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we know if Heather Hayes is in the room? Ah, is that Heather Hayes? Hayes, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, my stars. Heather Hayes right here with us in person. <laughs> hey, did you know that Heather Hayes is a research biologist with the Intermountain Bird Observatory in Boise, Idaho? She's worked on many research projects that include the long-billed curlew satellite tracking. And uh, she's, she's, <laughs> she's been uh, involved in eight state uh, science community project called the Western Osseo Flamaeus Landscape Study for Short-Eared Owls. I don't think I got that right, but- You did get it right, you're good. <laughs> gonna be close enough. Uh, she's also worked on the IBO's Hummingbird Monitoring Program. And she's extremely passionate about her role as a community science coordinator, developing K-12 STEM curriculum, conducting curlews in the classroom, and who doesn't want curlews in your classroom? Come on. <laughs> and she loves the ability to integrate her field work with education, bringing a unique perspective into not only the classroom, but into the hunter education classes as well. She dreams of the day she can visit Morro Coast, so do we, uh, so we can be in, all together and looking at long, build curlews on their wintering ground. Uh, did you see that last sketch of the long build curlew? I uh, did. I was very impressed with the, the 90 second sketch. I, I don't know, but that's a requirement. <laughs> you have to do the same thing. In, I'd be ashamed to show my little sketches when I have to draw where I see the nest from about 900 meters away. <laughs> okay, so Heather, I'm going to jump off the screen and leave it to you I because I'm looking forward to look uh, to learn about our long. We only care about one long built curlew. <laughs> And uh, you can tell us about that one. Others are fine too, uh, but uh, take it away. It's all yours. Okay, sounds great. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I'm so happy to be here uh, virtually in Morro Bay to talk about the iconic grassland species, the long-billed curlew. Um, and we're just gonna kind of have fun and talk about their biology. And I'm gonna share stories from the field that I've uh, gathered over my last eight years working on the program um, and kind of talk about why we've been studying the birds and the threats that uh, they're up against and what we've discovered through satellite tracking um, the birds and finding out what the driving factors are for their localized decline that we're seeing here in Southwest Idaho. Um, so before I turn it over to my program though, I always like to share um, my little friend here. I have a skull of a long-billed curlew just to kind of give you guys a real sense of in the hand, like how long this bill is. And I like to remind people, especially up on the wintering grounds where the birds are so defensive because of their chicks, that the curlew um, does not use this bill for any form of defense. Because if they were to chase something off or try to hit the back of a badger or a coyote or some type of predator, they run the risk of snapping that lower jaw off. And without that lower part, that mandible, they won't be able to eat. And so um, they also don't have the traditional, like when you think of a raptor, they don't have talons that they can defend themselves with. I'm sure most of you uh, have seen them walking on the coast. They have these weird little, just like chicken feet, um, but they do have a very effective strategy to chase off predators. And we're gonna talk about that next. 
Um, so let me turn it over to my program here. So just give me one moment. Share my sound. Okay, let me move this little bar out of my way. All right. Um, I don't know if somebody can pop on. Maybe Bob, can you pop on and give me a thumbs up that everything looks like it's presenting just fine? Looks good. Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to introduce everybody who maybe who is not as familiar with long build curlews to one right now. So that's just a real general call. You guys have probably heard they're chatting back and forth. How's your day going? What are you doing? This is where I am. Um, and the long billed curlew is North America's largest shorebird. Um, a lot of people um, in our area might be a little more familiar with the little cousin, uh, which is the uh, killdeer. And so it's really kind of unique, I think, that we have these shorebirds in the Intermountain West area. And so they like to come here to breed because they require the short grassland habitat because they're ground nesters. And so that low grassland in the beginning of the breeding season uh, is very helpful for them to see any predators coming their way. And then as that grass starts to grow and the chicks hatch, they now have good concealment from any predators. So their bill can grow up to about eight and a half inches long. And if you've ever held a chicken or a duck before, that's about what it feels like to hold a curlew. They're only about a pound or two. And this species exhibits something um, that is called sexual dimorphism. So basically just a big fancy science word that means that the male and the female look different. So um, I'm gonna give you a second to see if you guys know who is the male and who is the female in this picture. So I'll just give you a brief minute to think about it. And if anybody guessed that the male is the smaller one in the front, you are absolutely correct. So the males run smaller in body size and typically shorter bill. And the bill of the male runs a little bit um, off the face and a little bit more of a curve where the female in the back has a larger body and her bill is noticeably longer. And hers comes off the face much straighter with just a little bit of curve at the end. And having this to look at is very important for us out in the field when we're trying to find nests because there's certain specific times of the day we're looking for females and then specific times of day we're looking for the male. And we'll get into that a little bit more here in a few minutes. So why are we studying the long-billed curlew throughout the Intermountain West? Well, studies have showed that there has been quite a dizzying decline in our localized species throughout Southwest Idaho. And a lot of the people out on our public lands have been using the public lands for years. Like they've grown up recreating. Um, you can do all sorts of things on the public lands. You can ride your horses. Um, it's really popular for people who have ATVs or OHVs. Um, recreational shooting is very, very popular. And um, there's a, a specific species of ground squirrel that people are allowed, allowed to shoot. Uh, you can target, you know, take targets out there to shoot. So there's all types of recreation. So these people who have been steeped through generations have really gotten a sense of the land over the years. And they noticed that there just weren't these big clouds of curlews coming in anymore. So people started alerting the agencies like the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, um, the Bureau of Land Management, asking if they had um, any knowledge of this or if they knew what was going on. Um, and then there was a researcher from the University of Montana. He is the gentleman in the center of this picture and his name was Roland Redmond. And he did his master's thesis on the curlews. So he came to Idaho from Montana and he basically set up his study uh, on a section of public lands that was called the long-billed curlew habitat. And it's considered an ACEC. And what that means is area of critical environmental concern. And so he basically laid the foundation of a great population study on the section of lands. So in 1979, he counted roughly 2,000 individual curlews on this breeding territory. And so over time, the decline kept happening. And so 
the Intermountain Bird Observatory had gotten involved in 2009. And basically what we did is, you know, we looked at his previous study and his methods, and we did the same point count surveys that he did. So we ran the road same time of day, same season during the breeding season. And our point count surveys came back with data indicating there was now less than 100 individual curlews on the breeding territory. And it's even more unfathomable to think that this exact area where the study took place was recognized historically as the densest curlew nesting grounds in North America. And so we just finished up our year end report at the end of last year. And this area is now showing a 99%, estimated 99% decline, um, which is kind of ironic when this is deemed an area of critical environmental concern. So the big question is why? Why are the long-billed curlews in this stretch of Southwest Idaho declining? Because overall their range, the populations are generally stable. It's just this dramatic decline in this area. And so when you're researching, especially a migrating species, you're not just gonna stay focused in one area of their annual life cycle, right? So you're gonna try to see what's going on on their breeding grounds, and you're also gonna try to figure out what's happening uh, on their wintering grounds. And right off the bat, like here in Idaho, like on the public lands, there is such a diversity of wildlife. It's, it blew my mind. I came from Ohio, um, and when I hit the public lands for the first time, my mind was blown at the diversity in such a small area. And so for a ground nesting species, this small handful of um, predators you see here cause a lot of problems for curlews, especially ravens. We all know how smart ravens are. Um, so actually part of our protocol is we're not allowed to approach a nest if there are any ravens in the area or crows, um, whether it's on a cattle trough or a fence post or a telephone pole, if you can see it, they can see you. So we don't approach at all if we can see a crow or a raven. So these guys are trouble all the way around. Um, but then again, like I said, we wanna look at threats all across the range. So things like urban sprawl, like I don't know how many are familiar with the Boise area, um, but it's exploding. It is literally busting at the seams. It's always been in the top three places for people to move to these days. And that's putting a lot of incredible new pressure on the public lands because everybody wants to recreate out there because it's so much fun. Um, so that's putting a lot of pressure, not only on curlews, but all the other wildlife that's there as well. Um, and then if you think about their overwintering grounds, uh, our population of curlews, um, there's about 80% of the population of our tracked curlews go to the Central Valley of California. Uh, the other 20 um, is in the Mexico uh, zone. And so things they might be up against there would be drought, um, changes in agricultural practices, um, maybe even uh, rising sea level, um, pesticides. These guys eat copious amounts of insects. They're great insect control. Um, and then back to the public lands area, all the ATV riding can cause problems for these guys. Uh, this lower picture is a great example of how people aren't following the, the rules out there. You're only supposed to stay on the trail. And that picture should only have four trails in it. But over time, all those new trails were cut in because I guess people get bored riding on the same trail, even though it's the same hillside. Um, so this used to be a very popular nesting area for curlews. Um, and now when we do our point count surveys, we don't even count any birds that, that go over. There's We hear nothing go over when we do our counts there. So, um, and of course, all the other recreational um, things going on like uh, recreational shooting. Um, we knew there would probably be some issues with that. Um, but like all of these different hypotheses, we, we really didn't have a handle yet on the, the weight that any one of these was bearing on the population. So let's just touch base super quickly on their nesting biology. Uh, Long-billed curlews typically lay three to four eggs. If something happens to the nest, like say a badger gets the nest and it's early enough in the season, they will lay again. Um, but they typically lay less eggs, which I think is kind of cool that they know they don't have that same amount of time to rear and raise four chicks. Um, and as you can see in that picture, they spend about this much time making a nice fluffy nest because uh, they, they don't have the luxury. They are always looking for predators. 
So basically they get down to business really quickly and they look for a little depression on the ground. Uh, a lot of the nests we find are in a cow's hoof print um, or uh, the male will actually scrape a little bit in the ground and push his chest in the ground and then do a, like a little butt wiggle like that. And that makes a little depression. And so then he'll call the female over and see if she accepts what he made. And when you think about how long these guys are on the ground incubating, it's a little bit mind blowing. I mean, it's, it's a month that they're on the ground that they have to protect themselves day and night from anything and everything that's coming by. And so camouflage is really the name of the game. Um, you can see in this picture, there's two cow patties on either side of the nest. And I would say of all the pictures I've taken, 95% of the pictures I have, they're always next to cow patties. And we think that it's creating more of an aerial camouflage. So if there's a raven or a crow or a prairie falcon zipping low to the ground, having that extra visual distraction might keep them from seeing those eggs on the ground. And it's not just the eggs that are gonna be camouflaged, right? The chicks are gonna be very camouflaged, like those little cuties. Um, and then you can see the adult down there in the right-hand corner. Um, and that's a female. And I know that not because I can see her body size. In fact, I can't even see the length of her bill, but it's because it's during the daytime. And so remember how I said it, it depends what time of day when we're looking for a male or a female. Uh, and that's because um, the females in the morning when we get in place, we need to be in our spot at sunrise because as the sun hits the horizon, all the females come in and relieve the males. So the males sit all night. She comes in, gives a little good morning peep to him. He gives her a little peep and he takes off for the day. So she settles in for the whole day to incubate and protect those eggs. Every now and again, the male will pop in throughout the day and kind of survey his territory and make sure she's good and nothing's bugging her. But for the most part, he's off um, you know, getting something to eat and napping out. And then she does the same at night. So as you can see, she's, she's really low profile and that helps the camouflage as well. And you can probably tell if you look real close, she's leaning up against a big old dried up cow patty. And so um, if a predator were to walk by her right now, she would probably sit tight and not make a peep and really trust her camouflage. Because if she keeps getting up off that nest to chase something away, um, she's attracting a lot of unwanted attention. And so whether it be a raven or a badger or a coyote, um, she's going to catch the eye of something and she'll probably end up losing that nest. So the only time she really pops off during incubation or the male is if their life feels absolutely threatened and that they'll, they'll jump off and try to chase something away. But that just it shows how dedicated they are to that clutch that they will wait and not jump up every time. So here's your first baby curlew. And I love sharing this picture with kids because they're always so enamored and surprised that curlew chicks um, don't, aren't, or they don't hatch out with a really long bill. Um, so as you can see, their bill is really tiny. Um, and these guys are precocial. So basically as soon as they're hatched out, within about an hour or two, their eyes are open, they're fluffed out, um, like you saw in that little video I played earlier, and they're up running around beside mom and dad learning how to forage. So these guys don't have the luxury of sitting around waiting for mom and dad to come feed them like a songbird, right? Because songbird babies are born basically a couple feathers um, on their head, their eyes are sealed shut for a long time, and mom and dad are feeding them all the time throughout the day. Well, that is not the case with these guys. So within uh, maybe two or three hours, they could already be like 50 meters outside of the nest. And so the strategy that the adults use, it doesn't sound like it would do a good job, but it's actually very effective how they chase off predators. And they have a blood curdling scream and they do a very big aerobatic display and they dive bomb, which you guys have probably heard the term mobbing before. Um, sometimes if you see a red tail hawk flying over, you'll see a bunch of birds chasing its tail. And that's probably because that red tail hawk got too close to the tree where the chicks were. Same thing with the curlews. So when those chicks are about to hatch, that's when the adults switch gears and they, they don't stay quiet. They jump off the nest at every chance to chase off a predator. And so I'm going to play for you the alarm call. And 
another note about this alarm call and why it's so effective is because it is so loud that it is broadcast across the landscape and all the other nesting curlews can hear it. So it becomes a strategy of strength in numbers. So all the other nesting curlews will come help chase the predator away that's bothering those adults. So let me play the alarm call for you, but bear in mind, it's only one bird that you're gonna hear. So try to just imagine what it would be like, you minding your own business, walking out in a farmer's field, um, and all of a sudden you hear this screaming, and then all of a sudden all these birds are dive bombing. So have a listen. So it's really, really loud. It doesn't sound really loud here, but when you're out in the field, it's deafening. Um, I, this, this is my eighth year I'm going into, and I gotta tell you, it's, it's the same every year. It makes my heart jump. Um, I try to get in and out as soon as possible. We need to go check to see uh, on hatch date how many chicks have hatched. Um, but my advice to people that find themselves in that situation, when you get dive bombed, don't run. Make sure you walk out of the area because like I said, those little chicks could already be, you know, feeling around their territory and hiding in the grass and there's super camouflage, especially when the cheat grass is in full color. Um, so the best way to get curlews to stop chasing you is to walk out of the area and I don't know, maybe two, 300 meters uh, and everybody goes back to doing their business and you can get on to doing your business. Um, so. And this is just a really quick video. I get people ask me all the time, you know, what it's like when they're actually dive bombing. So I took this really brief video after I checked, a, a, did a nest check and these two curlews were escorting me back to my car. So as you see, they get really, really close to you, but they're not gonna risk, like I said, hurting their beak and they don't have talons and I know that. So I just kind of duck down and I slowly walk out of there looking around my feet as I'm heading out uh, to get to the car. Uh, and another reason you wanna get going is because then all the other curlews are gonna start in on you too. So we started our program in 2009, but we didn't start putting satellite transmitters on birds until 2013. So that's when we were able to start securing grant funding um, to try to find out many things about the birds. But uh, two of the big things we were looking at was where are our breeding population going? Like where are they overwintering? What routes are they taking? What habitats do they utilize on their way? Um, and we were also hoping that we could discover what the driving forces were behind this uh, decline. But the first thing we had to learn how to do is how to catch a curlew. Like we did not know how to catch a curlew. So we have had a longstanding um, bird banding station at the top of a mountain called Lucky Peak. It's right outside of Boise. Um, and we use songbird mist nets. And so they're these really fine mesh nets and they're really long. They're like 18 meters long. So we knew that curlews weren't just gonna jump into these nets like a songbird flies into them. But we thought, well, what if we took the poles out of the ground, you know, stretched it out, two people carry it out, and um, out straight to the nest and drop it over the nest and then that mesh would just float over the bird. So we tried it and it worked like a dream. And so there's a bit of the net that you can see in the picture on the left. Uh, like I said, it's super, super fine. It's like thread. So the birds actually kind of don't even feel it on them until it really settles down. Um, and so what we'll do is we have a biologist up on a hillside and they see the bird on the nest and they talk us down on a walkie talkie or our cell phones um, down to the nest because we can't see it whatsoever. So they'll let us know when we're getting close. And then typically one of the biologists on either end of the net will eventually see the bird. We'll kind of get up on our tiptoes and we'll see it up ahead. And you'll start to see the curlew sink down and get really flat to the ground. Um, and, I, and we have a really good trap rate um, but sometimes the birds, I don't know if it's cause it's maybe their first time ever, you know, having a nest that they see us coming and they don't sit, but literally almost, I don't know. I say we probably have a 95% trap rate, um, and it works really well, but I want to point out in this picture too, do you see another cow patty by the nest? So there's another example of additional camouflage. 
and it's during the day. So we know that this bird, that Jay, our research director, is holding is a female. So we will walk the bird back to the roadside where we have our equipment and we'll start the banding process. And we, we band the birds, we take a whole bunch of um, morphometric data like weighing the bird, measuring their wing and tail. Um, and we also measure the length of their bill. And the reason we do that is because that kind of tells us how big the bird is. Um, when we go to the doctor's office, you know, they, they weigh us, right? And then they'll take your height. Well, obviously we can't ask the curly to stand there and let us do all that. So um, what we do then is we measure the bill and that tells us how big the bird is. And this girl here, she had a pretty long bill. In fact, our micrometer, if you can just tell the tip of the beak can't be quite measured um, because it was so long. I think she was almost nine inches long. And then that's a great example of their feet. They just go like chicken feet. And then uh, we had a graduate student from Boise State University named Stephanie Coates, who did um, her master thesis on the curlews. Um, and she brought into the program some additional, uh, additional data collection methods. So we did a little tiny blood draw from the wing and we were also doing what's called a buccal swab. So it's basically like a cheek swab, trying to just get a, some cheek cells out of the, the part of right inside the bill. Um, so looking for you know, any genetic issues or disease issues. Um, and what was very interesting is when we did the swab with the Q-tip the first time, uh, we discovered a really cool adaptation about the curlew's bill, which a lot of shorebirds have. Um, and I'm gonna play a video for you and take special note of the tip of the bill and see if you can tell what's happening. Can you guys tell that it's bending? And so shorebirds are able to bend the tip of their bill, which is pretty cool, especially when these guys are probing into the sand for their food, right? And so they can't see, they're kind of shooting in the dark. And so they have these little sensory um, uh, parts to the tip of their bill that help them sense their prey underground and help them pull it up. So it was so cool to see that because in the beginning, every time we had a curlew in our hand, we had noticed, I'll show you here, I don't know if it'll be easy to see or not, but this tip part of the bill had all these grooves on the, on the tip. And we never really knew what those grooves were for, but every single curlew had it. So then when we saw this happen and realized that, oh, this is the adaptation rhynchokinesis, meaning you know, it can bend its bill. Um, so then we put two and two together that those ridges allowed that bend. So think of, a, think of a plastic bendy straw that you're able to you know, make a little bit longer and bend. It has those ridges. Well, that was the same with the curlew's bill. And this is just a great video that was sent in to us um, by a birder in Morro Bay, Carol Palo and um, just shows really how far they go down. And this is probably old news to you guys. I'm used to giving this presentation and people don't get to see the birds on their wintering grounds. Um, but every time I watch it, since I haven't been there, I'm always so amazed at how far down they can probe. And when they're up here in the Intermountain West, the public lands are pretty dry. It's considered high desert. So what they're eating here is more like spiders, tons of insects, like they're a great insect control for agricultural fields. Um, and then when they're maybe in a wetland in Mexico and they're overwintering, they're probably eating lots of grubs and earthworms, insects as well. And then of course on the beach, little ghost shrimp, sand crabs, things like that. And so after we get done with all those measurements and the banding process, then we kind of take a deep breath and we get ready to um, attach the harness that has the backpack transmitter. So think of like um, a rock climbing harness. That's kind of what I like in these two. Um, so it's got two little leather leg loops, one that's already made into a loop. So we kind of pull it up uh, the one leg and then we attach the other one around and then we crimp it together. So this transmitter only weighs about nine and a half grams. And I think that's about the weight of two nickels. Um, and it's solar powered. So those are the two little solar windows you see. And uh, that charges up a little tiny micro battery inside of there. And so the cool thing about these transmitters is that we gain about three years worth of data, like three annual life cycles. Um, and then we're able to take them off because the males have what's called high site fidelity. 
So that means they like to come back to the same nesting area year after year. They're very tied to that area. So all we have to do is go back out into that area and find uh, the nest of the male or the female, whoever has the transmitter, and then we're able to retrap them and take the transmitter off. So we don't wanna just attach this and let the bird go and wish it good luck. Um, we really wanted to try to discover a way to see if the bird would communicate somehow and let us know if that transmitter was comfortable or not. And what we discovered is they do tell us. And what we do is we put up a camping tent. And after we get the transmitter temporarily fitted, we release the bird in the tent. And it's gonna do one of two things if it's uncomfortable, like say it's a little pinchy on one side or feels weird. Um, the bird is either going to run around inside the tent like crazy, or it's going to sit right down. So I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to think, like, what would you do if something was attached to you and you were just a little comfortable and needed to let somebody know that you were uncomfortable? If you said plop right down until somebody took that off of you, you're right. So these guys basically um, will maybe take a few steps, but for the most part, they just kind of, you know, kind of go back and forth a little bit and they sit right down. So what we'll do is we'll take the bird back out. We readjust the straps a little bit, and then we put them back in for a second walk test. And this is what we want to see. So this girl right here, she doesn't care about the bands on her legs. She doesn't care about that transmitter on her back. All she can focus on right now is getting back to that nest for incubation. And then as soon as we see them up and running like that, we want to make sure we release them back because the longer we hang out there after we release them, they won't go back to their nest because they view us as a predator, right? So they don't want to lead us to the nest. So they'll walk around, they'll pretend like they're eating, but they're actually side eyeing you from a distance and they'll do all these circles, they'll stand and sleep. So we wanna make sure that they get back to that nest and back to business of incubating. So we release them, gather up our gear, and we go to another hillside where we'll set up our scopes and make sure that they go back to the nest. And that's one of the biggest questions we get is, has there ever been a bird that's never gone back to the nest? Um, and the answer is no, they've all gone back. Um, we just kind of sit and wait it out. And when they feel safe and they don't see us where we were, then they'll go back and start incubating. So then the cool part is anybody and everybody can get on the link that will take you right to the map that shows all of our birds, all the ambassador birds of our research flock. So if you want to take a screenshot of the link below, uh, you can use that, or you can just Google up the words Curlew Satellite Tracking or some combination of those words, um, and it should pop up for you. Uh, and also, if you don't like the gray color of the map, there's a little button you'll see that says Change Base Layer, and you can click on that, and it'll make it look like satellite, or it'll make it look like an atlas, so whatever your preference is. Um, but you can just take your cursor, and you can click on a dot, and each dot is one bird, and this window shows up and it's gonna tell you either the bird's name, if it's named already, or it's alpha code, which is on its plastic green leg band. So this particular bird doesn't have a name yet, it's MY, and it'll tell you the last time that the satellite and the transmitter spoke to one another and had that transmission. So it'll tell you the day, the date, and the time. So you won't see the dots moving around live streaming, um, because the, the transmitter needs time to recharge. And so it'll send a couple pings throughout the day and then it shuts down for a cycle before it'll come back up the next day. And like any other Google map, you can zoom in, which is what I did with this cluster of birds just south of Los Angeles. Um, and you can see here, um, and this is when it gets really interesting because you can start to see where the tracks go. So you can see where's the bird been flying since its last transmission. Uh, if you have the satellite view up, you can see, is it going out to an agricultural field during the day? Uh, is it sleeping out, um, out by a lake during the evening? Um, so you can really get a sense of what these birds are doing. So we don't have enough time tonight to go through all the amazing things that these transmitters have um, uncovered for a lot of the mysteries that we have, but I do want to go over some of the main ones. And 
it was awesome, obviously, to discover where all of our study birds were going, whether it was from Wyoming or Montana, Idaho, um, New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico is their most southern part of their range, and British Columbia is the most northern. So now we had a great picture. But what was like a glaring black hole to us was none of our breeding birds were going to the coast of California. They all seemed to hit the Central Valley, uh, like that breadbasket area of agriculture, and they just stopped right there. So we just had this, you know, gnawing question, well, where are the coastal birds breeding? So we thought instead of going from A to B, that we would try going from B to A. And what I mean by that is we decided to head to California and meet up with a team of biologists and see if we couldn't transmit our two birds on the beach and follow them back to their breeding grounds. Um, so that was super exciting. Um, it was on Lemon Tour Beach in Point Reyes, uh, north of Morro Bay. And this was part of a larger effort with the Smithsonian's Migratory Connectivity Project. Um, but it was you know, building on, on all of this other data and, and years of work with curlews. So we trapped a male and a female. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, we were all on the edge of our seats. And uh, what we discovered is one of the birds did come to Idaho, but it was not one of our study areas. Uh, it passed by our study areas and landed near Chalice, um, a little area called Leodore, Idaho. And the other bird was right on the Idaho-Nevada border in Nevada on the Duck, um, Duck Valley Indian Reservation. Um, so still exciting news, but didn't solve our mystery of where, you know, you know, why did we have no coastal breeding birds? So enter COVID, right? Pandemic hits. Um, I live up in the West Central Mountains and typically travel to Boise and stay down there for the field season to study on the public lands. Um, I was very fortunate to get some additional grant funding where I was able to stay home up in the mountains that season and start a new study site in the West Central Mountains. So we had one in New Meadows, which is basically uh, my back door. And then another one in Indian Valley. And Indian Valley sits at about 3,000 feet in elevation. And that's when we trapped Dozer, our very first bird of the breeding territory that we followed to coastal California. And so that's our connection with Morro Bay. And what is so exciting to me and the team is that, like I mentioned before, 80% of our curlews kind of stop right in that that zone of the agricultural central valley and imperial valleys of california and people don't normally hang out in those areas right and so now we have a transmitter bird on the beach where there's tons of people there are surfers there's birders there's hikers there's dog walkers um we have had so many phone calls and emails and pictures of people that have spotted dozer and had said they you know called local authorities uh, in biology and, and said, hey, there's this transmitter bird. Do you know anything about it? Which then leads back to the Intermountain Bird Observatory here in Idaho. And so it has been so fun to have eyes on these birds that we spend so much time with for three months to not see them again for a whole nother year. So um, it just warms my heart. And and like Chris said in the beginning, I, I do want to come to Morro Bay so bad to see those are on the beach. So I hope I can make that happen. Um, so we set our sights the next year on trying to trap Dozer's mate. So in 2020, their nest had failed. The female had taken off early um, and Dozer hung out for a little bit and then he took off. So um, the next year in 2021, we were able to trap his mate Mimi. And so that was super exciting. And we were kind of on the edge of our seats wondering, you know, is Mimi going to end up in California? Is she going to end up in Mexico? Um, because one of the other discoveries we made is the mated pair do not stay together and fly out to the wintering grounds together. That is only for breeding. So many of our birds, whether they're mated in their, they go to California, they'll be hundreds of miles apart from each other. And that is exactly what happened with Mimi and Dozer. So Dozer's hanging out in Morro Bay and Mimi was the international traveler. And so she ended up in Mexico in a wonderful biosphere reserve um, full of wetlands and great resources and basically more of a protected area. 
Um, so that was um, almost a year to the date from Trapping Dozer. Um, so I am very excited and that we're now going into 2022 and anxious to get down to Indian Valley and catch up with these two. Um, they did have a successful nest. Uh, last year, I went to walk out to the nest, which was a little more difficult because they were nesting in an agricultural field full of alfalfa. And so I located the nest and um, the eggshells were all around and I was getting dive bombed like crazy, but I didn't see their chicks. But their aggressiveness and defensiveness told me those chicks were out in the alfalfa without a doubt. And then we had a fun few minutes where we actually had to stop the banding. We were getting ready to give her the walk test in the tent, but the ranchers were pushing the cattle down the road, uh, moving them into a new pasture. Uh, so you just kind of never know what your banding day is gonna entail, but there's always something fun and exciting. And then this is just a quick map to show you guys uh, the distance. So the blue star is Dozer uh, in Morro Bay, and then his love is hanging out down in Mexico until they meet up again. And that's a quick picture of those two right there. And then in the beginning of the season, um, or in the beginning of the study, we typically found birds that looked like they were torn up in pieces like a predator got them. And it wasn't until we put the transmitters on that we really started to uncover the driving forces of the decline we were seeing locally here in Southwest Idaho. So the Department of Fish and Game has a wildlife health laboratory and they said that we could take any of the carcasses of the birds into them and they would x-ray them for us. And this is the very first x-ray we got back after we found one of our transmitted birds um, down on the ground. And it was torn up just like that other bird. And this was the forensics, uh, just a clip of the forensics report that we got back. And you can see the preliminary and final diagnosis are the same, gunshot and then scavenging. So in that red circle, you can see where it's really bright white that's actually metal from being shot. So the birds are actually getting shot first, then left on the landscape, and then the scavengers come, like a, a badger or a coyote. I mean, they're not gonna pass up a free meal. So if there's something lying on the ground, they're gonna you know, pull it apart and eat what they can. So from 2013, when we started transmittering birds to 2018, we had lost almost half of our transmitted birds in Southwest Idaho to poaching. So like I said in the beginning, we knew there was gonna be issues with recreational shooting, but we had no idea that it was going to be such a big issue. And I just wanted to tell you about one more spot that we were working in. It's called the uh, Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. And it's south of Boise and another huge tract of public land. And it was a really rough go for the birds there. So we had three birds go down. And what that means is we, when we check the map, we notice a dot hasn't been moving for a few days, which could suggest a bad transmitter or something's wrong with the bird. So we sent a biologist out that had specialized equipment that can pick up the signal inside that transmitter. And so when he put in the final um, GPS points for these birds, this shooting spot came up in the center. And I didn't know that you could put a public pin on a Google map, I had no idea like people could see that. And so we are not saying that the person obviously who dropped that pin on the map is the person who shot these birds, but what it does suggest is this is a highly used recreational shooting area. So now we have these hot spots popping up that we can have exact GPS points that we can now share with Bureau of Land Management uh, and law enforcement agencies that they can beef up their um, watch in these areas. And what's really disappointing is these two birds here were a mated pair and their chicks had just hatched a week prior. And so when you think about a long lived species, um, you know, the population can't come back from this type of exponential loss. Like it's, it's an unsustainable rate. So you have two breeding adult curlews that are now gone. And this is not a species where another set of curlew parents are gonna come take care of those chicks. So we've now theoretically lost four others out of the breeding population. So that's really hard to take. And so we knew after all this data had been collected after all these years, like we really needed to change up our thinking. You know, first we're thinking, how do we control these predators when now we have evidence that recreational shooting is a huge driving factor. 
So we're involved in a lot of outreach efforts, but just my last few minutes I have here, I just want to talk about the two that are um, going right now. And we've developed a very brief 15 minute program that we take into hunters education classes. And we do this not because we think hunters are shooting curlews. We're doing it because we know hunters are in classes to become ethical and knowledgeable recreators while they're out shooting on the public lands. And we were hoping that we could educate them about the curlews, how they're a protected species, it's illegal to shoot them, and talk about all the other protected species that we are now discovering that are getting shot as well. Um, we're finding um, raptors shot off of power poles. Um, we're finding um, burrowing owls uh, shot just um, uh, badger, like there's just a whole host of things that, that are not making it out there. So we're trying to get the word out. Uh, and it's been a big collaborative effort with the Idaho Bird Conservation Partnership, Fish and Game, and the BLM. And our longest running program is Curlews in the Classroom. Um, and this has been uh, a much sought after program now, uh, K through 12. Um, we engage the students with our satellite tracking map. Um, it's awesome that we can like share this real-time data with them, that they can actually see what's happening 24-7, and that they can actually, at migration time, see these lines start forming all the way back to the breeding grounds and then following it back to the overwintering grounds. Um, we've also started a program called Teachers, or Curlews Outside the Classroom, where we take teachers only. Um, so the teachers can actually get out there with us, see it firsthand, how dangerous it is for these birds with all the ATVs, all the shooting, all the recreation. Um, and that can kind of make a deeper connection between the teacher and the student. And we help them develop curriculum and things like that as well. So I could go on and on about curlews like for the next four hours, but I know my time is limited. Um, but I do like to end by stating we're a, a small nonprofit uh, under Boise State University. Um, we're a research unit of the campus, um, but we're not funded by the university. So we would not be able to do what we do without these people on the screen here, whether it's a government agency, whether it's other NGOs or um, other nonprofits, and especially private people, uh, private collaborators that allow us access to their land to find a transmitter that's down or allow us to get, you know, cross fences to get to a curlew nest. Um, we couldn't do it without them. Um, and a lot of the funds that we try to raise through our t-shirt sales and other things like that, um, we try to raise money for the next year's transmitters. Uh, the transmitters run about $3,500 a piece. Um, and then there's an additional 1,200 just for the data fees, like to have everything up online so the public can access it at any time. Um, so, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but the map, we share that map with the Utah Department of Natural Resources and they study pelicans. So you'll see a pelican on it, not a curlew, because we get a lot of people saying, I see a pelican. Um, and there's so much data on this map now, it's getting really sluggish. And so it might not pop up for you right away. So my best advice is keep trying, give it some time. But if it still doesn't come up for you, try to use Firefox. And if it still doesn't come up for you, email me and I will kind of give you a, a, another map that you can log on to. It just takes a while to explain and it's easier to see it in writing. So if anybody has any questions that don't get answered tonight, please send me an email. Um, I love talking about these birds. And if there's one thing that you could do for curlew conservation today and it takes a second is head to Facebook, hit a thumbs up on the curlew crew, share a picture of a curlew. Um, we all know what Facebook is like. It's you know, the growth is crazy. You share it with one friend, they share it with five, they share it with 10. Um, and it really gets the awareness out of, of this fantastic bird that we all love so much. And the Intermountain Bird Observatory is a Facebook page that's all birds. And we're also on Twitter and Instagram. So feel free to reach out with any questions. So thank you again for having me. Okay, Heather, that was fantastic. Bob, if you could leave that slide up. Um, everybody, uh, somebody who's good at typing, type those things down and put it in the uh, chat so we can have that in the chat. And, um, and we'll try to post that on our bird festival site as well. Uh, Heather, your expertise was amazing. Thank you for your willingness to come and share. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in Morro Bay. You know, there's about 250 people that have been, you know, watching these things and uh, they would all want to put you up in Morro Bay <laughs> for free if you talk curlew to them. Uh, so, uh, 
So just give us a ring when you need a, a place to stay in Morro Bay. Okay, sounds, we are going to actually uh, shut this Heather, one down for a couple minutes. Pardon? Heather, I'm asking Heather to drop her screen scare, share. Yeah, oh, Heather, sure. drop yeah. your screen. Thanks. Okay, uh, we are gonna. Um, we We're are gonna slide going straight to, in, Chris. Okay, uh, I I have to uh, go put a hawk away real quick. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, so we have five minutes. Can we just close it down yeah, for okay, five minutes? Okay, close down. Yeah, we'll close down. Okay. Okay, we're going to uh, close it down for five minutes, everybody. Thank you, Heather. You're amazing. Thank you. And we'll see you all at the top of the hour. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.